Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to um, uh, this afternoon's uh, session, which marks the first of the uh, the option uh, sessions for the uh, HSMA training. So, um, uh, as we said this morning, uh, the idea with the core sessions was to give you a, a sort of taster into um, the possibilities of uh, many of these uh, methods um and uh to give you some uh, idea about uh where you could potentially use them and to uh, generate some potential ideas um uh for you moving into your project work in in particular uh so this afternoon we're starting uh, to delve a little deeper into uh one of those uh, areas um and uh this afternoon it's the turn of uh system dynamics uh and so we talked about system dynamics um, in the call session a few weeks back, uh, we talked about what uh, system dynamics is. We got you to do some uh, causal loop diagrams and looking for various um, uh, uh, loops, reinforcing loops and balancing loops and things like that. Um, and then um, uh, we had Dave uh, who gave a fantastic presentation uh, on how he'd used um, uh, Insight Maker and quantitative system dynamics in order to uh, create a model uh, for, uh, for COVID planning um, in Devon. So the object of, of this afternoon's session is to give you some hands on time uh, to build your own um, uh, model in uh, Insight Maker. So you get some practice on how this thing works and also to show you some of the other uh, features that you can do in Insight Maker, um, but also to uh, give you a bit of practice into uh, critically appraising uh, models um, as well because actually it's a very important skill um, in modeling uh, to not only be able to create models but but to be able to um, critically appraise them and, and to understand what makes a good model and to identify uh, its shortcomings uh, as well so uh, you'll have a bit of a practice on doing that um, as well today and that of course can apply to anything uh, not just system dynamics but uh, um, any uh, type of model. Um, I mean, the other thing I would say, system dynamics is a bit of an odd one. I, so I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with system dynamics, um, and I'm never quite sure which side of the fence uh, I fall onto. Um, uh, Mike is very sure. Mike, Mike just hates system dynamics, um, and I can kind of understand it because it is a bit of a it's a bit of an odd modeling method, although there are, it's a very popular one. Um, I think my take on system dynamics is that there are a lot of very bad system dynamics models out there a lot of them uh, and very often there are two key issues sometimes it's people trying to do system dynamics models where um, actually that isn't the right fit but more commonly and the bigger problem I think is that a lot of people try to do system dynamics models and make them so big and so unfocused because that this modeling method kind of uh, encourages you in a way to do that um, that it actually becomes meaningless and you know you, I've seen some really bad models that just chuck in well no data whatsoever or just it's just completely made up and there's a very thin line between creating a uh, a model where you're making some assumptions and then just creating a model where you've just made everything up um, and uh, where that happens and unfortunately I think it does happen a lot in system dynamics um, you do have to question a little bit the utility of that model. So having said that though, and I've often toyed with the idea of should we teach system dynamics, I think it's worth it because every now and then there is a system dynamics model, and I think Dave is, uh, Dave's model is a really good example of this actually, um, where you can use have a really good application of system dynamics that has good data and a clear impact. Um, uh, so I think th there's, there's a lot of... Um, very few diamonds and a lot of rough but i think uh, uh every now and then something come, comes uh, you come across a system dynamics model that can uh, really surprise you so um but i think it is harder to think of um system dynamics models that are more useful and it's particularly because of that different way of thinking uh, i think so before we sort of go on i just want to give you a sort of a quick recap because it's been a few weeks um and uh, you've, you've been exposed to a lot of stuff uh, since uh, since then, in in, in uh, not least uh, this morning, certainly I think system dynamics. One advantage it has is it's much easier, um, a much easier kind of modelling method to actually do the technical stuff um, than 
say something useful this morning so that, that, that's a good positive um but let's just take you through some of the things we talked about uh before so system dynamics uh, models are formed of a number of key building blocks um and uh, if you remember before i talked about how a good way to think of a system dynamics model is to almost think like a plumbing system it's quite a good analogy to use for these kinds of models so essentially you have stuff flowing around your system and th that stuff accumulates in stocks and stocks hold that stuff a bit like um, uh, uh, tanks holding water um, and they flow between those stocks and in and out of the system as well so um, the flows determine uh, the ways in which your stuff whatever it is uh, moves around your system uh, and and we can change the rate of those flows as well and that's uh, usually important for what we're trying to explore so you've got stuff flowing around accumulating in in tanks or stocks uh, and they're flowing along these flows you can imagine um, uh, almost like pipes connecting these these tanks um, you've also got these things called variables which obviously you're familiar with in in python now um, but essentially variables um, specify things that aren't captured by stocks or flows um, but which will in some way influence either a stocks level or a rate of flow uh, so it might be some extra piece of information um, that that we need to include and which can vary uh, hence the name variable um, that uh, that can determine the flow rate around a system uh, and then uh, coupled with that we have links uh, and links essentially say there is a connection between this variable uh, and uh, this stock or this flow rate or even a link between um, this uh, stock and and um, uh, this variable this stock and this uh, flow etc there's a way of saying uh, it, a link goes hand in hand with a flow a flow is something where things are actually your stuff is actually moving uh, from one place to another from one stock to another whereas a link says uh, nothing is moving here along this link but there is an association between these things and that usually determines the rate of flow in most uh, system dynamics models now dave showed you some extra features in insight maker things like um, conveyors etc which um, you can also do in, in system dynamics it's got some extra little features that allow you to do that uh, i'm not going to go into that um, today uh, we're just going to stick with the core uh, building blocks of a, a system dynamics model now you'll also remember uh, that i talked a bit about um, some of the quirks uh, to put it politely of system dynamics uh, models and how they differ um, from some of the other models that, that we've looked at so in particular and probably the, the key one is you need to think of your stuff that's flowing through the model not as um, a collection of individual entities like patients or whatever it may be although your stuff that you're modeling could represent patients um, but as a continuous mass like water like some sort of liquid um, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment the other thing to bear in mind that system dynamics models unlike virtually every modeling method we've shown you are not stochastic there's no randomness um, in a system dynamics model um, every time you run that model you'll get the same result it's a deterministic model um, because you're usually not interested in um, if you're building an SD model for the right purpose you're usually not interested in um, the the kind of randomness in the system you're interested in the general pattern of the dynamics of the system uh, you can incorporate there are ways to put distributions for example in system dynamics and insight maker allows you to do that but it's not true system dynamics if you were uh, to do that um, and typically with system dynamics models we're not we're, we're more interested in those general patterns the general dynamics in the system rather than trying to get uh, more uh, sort of meaningful tangible predictions of things like you know you need uh, x doctors to meet this demand y percent of the time the, the sort of things you tend to get out of system dynamics models are um, we we tend to see that there's there's an effect happening over here which is leading to an increase and if we change this maybe that's where we should focus our intervention because we think that could calm the system down it's that kind of question that you tend to ask uh, more than uh, you know how many uh, resources do we need to meet this 
level of activity, which would probably be more of a discrete event type question, for example. Um, so let's remind ourselves of the, uh, the just briefly, the chicken and um, egg model um, uh, that we have, where we, we said that that's an example of a system dynamics model where chickens lay eggs and eggs hatch into chickens, and we've essentially got a reinforcing uh, loop here. Uh, we also said, just to demonstrate this first point here about um, the fact that you're dealing with a continuous mass of flow, um, that there's something very odd in the way you have to describe it. So if we imagine that um, uh, chickens lay eggs and the eggs uh, take on average uh, 21 days to hatch. Um, and uh, we model, we, in our model, we have our time units representing weeks, so we're modeling in units of weeks. Um, and we know that chickens lay on average five eggs per week, um, then the way in which we would describe the number of eggs hatching per week would be the number of eggs over three. Uh, and I'll just remind you of why that is. So if we had a single egg, uh, it would take three weeks, 21 days to hatch. But in system dynamics world, that means a third of the egg hatches per week even though that's physically impossible, but the, a third of it is flowing from not hatched to hatched each week. Similarly, if we had two eggs, then each week one third of each of those eggs would hatch, which would mean after a week we'd have two one thirds of eggs hatched, or two thirds of an egg. Um, and then, of course, if you think about taking that to its logical conclusion, after three weeks we'd expect two chickens, uh, because uh, two eggs um, would have hatched because it takes three weeks. Um, and indeed, that's that's what we would have. So essentially, what we're saying is the the number of eggs hatching per week in system dynamics world would be uh, an, the number of eggs uh, times a third, um, because a third of an egg will hatch per week for each egg, which we can just simplify to um, number of eggs uh, over three. It's really weird, and it does highlight that different way of modelling. Um, uh, and that you're you're not modeling it's very different to something like discrete event simulation where you're modeling people waiting in a queue they're waiting for a resource when that resource becomes available they will then uh, use that resource spend an amount of time with them uh, and then that resource will be released as they leave the other side that doesn't happen in, in sd world you have things flowing uh, so if you have patients coming into something uh, you know a uh, one twelfth of that patient may flow per time unit into something else. So it highlights the different way in which you need to approach system dynamics and the different kind of problem that you need to think about um, if you're using a system dynamics model. Uh, so let's just uh, have a look back at um, Insight Maker and the uh, chicken and egg model. Um, so here we created our um, very simple chicken and egg model. Uh, we've got a stock of chickens up here and we've got a stock of eggs and we said that uh, eggs will flow into chickens because uh, it would be fair to say that an, uh, for the purposes of this model that an egg becomes a chicken it, it, once the egg hatches it's no longer an egg and is now a, a chicken um, but it's not true to say that a chicken becomes an egg uh, but chickens do lay eggs uh, so in this model we said well essentially what we've got is eggs coming into being uh, in our model uh, and there's a rate at which they come into being and the rate at which they come into being is determined both by the laying rate of a chicken so how many uh, eggs it lays per week and also of course the number of chickens um, and so here the laying uh, rate of chickens uh, we define as simply the number of chickens multiplied by the laying rate and if I click on the laying rate um, you can see that we've got a value of five so we're saying each chicken will lay five eggs per week uh, so if we've got uh, two chickens, then each week we'll have 10 eggs coming into being into this eggs stock here. Um, in our model here, we start with 100 chickens and we start with no eggs. Um, and uh, our eggs will need to hatch and become chickens. Uh, and uh, we specify the rate here, as we've just talked about, as being the number of eggs over three, because a third of an egg uh, will hatch per week. Uh, so that's eggs over three, essentially. Um, so just a reminder of how um, uh, uh, Insight Maker works. Uh, so we have these uh, primitives, um, which are the stocks and flows and variables and links, etc., that we want to put on. So if we want to add uh, a stock, we uh, hover over the top left here, where it says add primitive, um, and the system dynamics ones are all at the top. 
ignore the agent based stuff um, and we can click add stock and then simply drag that around wherever we want it and then if we created uh, another stock here so that there for example if i wanted to then create a flow between those two stocks then i simply make sure that flows or transitions is, is selected up here rather than links uh, and then i hover over uh, the stock it's coming from uh, until that little arrow appears then left click and drag to wherever i want it to go and that creates a flow and i can rename these things just by um actually don't double click because that can cause problems if you click left click on them over on the right you'll get information in this panel uh, whatever you click will bring up um, relevant information about that particular uh, primitive uh, so if i click on a flow it'll come up with a name um, and lots of other things that that um, some of which you won't need to know at this stage um, but the two uh, two of the key things that you'll need to know are how to name so i just click on that and i can rename that whatever i want so i might call that stock a for example um, this one here which says uh, allow negatives so if you want a stock this will come up saying allow negatives bizarrely and i think this is bizarre it, it um, allows negatives by default in system dynamics that basically means say we've got a hundred things over here and nothing in this stock uh, sorry i've done the wrong one hundred uh, things that are units of stuff here and then they're all flowing into stock a over here um, eventually if nothing else is coming into this stock then this stock will become empty but by default uh, it will allow that stock to become negative so it will continue flowing things out and it'll just say okay there's now minus one in here there's now minus two minus three now that might be useful in some situations but typically you probably don't want that so it's a good habit to get into unless you really do want negative values in your stock um, to uh, set that to no whenever you create a, a new stock the initial value on a stock basically just says how how much how many units of stuff whatever your stuff is uh, do you want um, in the stock at the start it might be that you want nothing uh, in a stock or it might be that you want uh, a certain amount of stock if you've got uh, a closed system where nothing is coming in you're going to need to at least have at least one stock that's got something in it uh, otherwise you'll have a very dull system um, don't worry too much about the behavior stuff the slider stuff down here basically allows you to play around with things so let's say i've uh, i want to add in a variable here and let's say i link it so i click links and in the same way i do for flows i hover over the middle of the thing i want to link from and then connect it to the thing i want to link to so in this case i've set up a variable and i'm saying that is going to determine the flow rate this variable here i can choose uh, to specify um, a slider so that the user can change the value of that slider so i can set this show value slider to yes and then i can say um, okay well that's the maximum value i want the user to select that's the minimum and this is the increment i want them to be able to select it in increments of, of two for example uh, and then if i click off that uh, you'll see new variable here um, has got this slider which uh, defaults to zero and again you can you can change that um, and uh, we can then play around with it so i can set that to whatever i like as a, as a user so it's a really easy way to be able to get the user to play around with certain aspects um, of your model but one of the key things that you want to be doing in system dynamics is to specify uh, the equations essentially the uh, the flow rates and the way you would do that, um, if you click on a flow rate here, let's say, um, actually, no, let's just take that simple example. So if I click on that flow rate, uh, you'll see here it comes up if you're on a, if you're on a flow, uh, it comes up with uh, flow rate equals zero. If I click on that and click the little arrow next to it, it brings you up to this equation editor. And this is how we specify the rate of flow, which is fundamental to your, uh, to your model. Now the beauty of this is that you can literally just click on things uh, to assemble your equation so let's say my flow here i want to say well it's whatever this variable is um, multiplied by two so i can click it'll automatically bring up all of the things that i've said are linked into that flow rate so you can see new variable is listed there which is the thing i manually linked in but also by uh, automatically it will bring in um the two uh stock uh two stocks that can uh, are connected in that flow they're automatically connected so you can refer to those as well 
So it might be that I want to say this flow rate is just double whatever the user sets as that variable, in which case I can just click new variable, it'll bring that in, and then I can say multiply by using the asterisk two, and then I can click apply. And that flow rate now is uh, basically saying whatever this variable is times two per time unit. So if that was uh, set to uh, 16, um, then uh, every time unit, 32 units of stuff would flow from this stock to this stock. But you may also want to do something where it's not just based on this variable, it might also be based on uh, one of your stock levels. So it might be it's 16, oh sorry, that's just one thing. Uh, it might be that you say it's the new variable times by the number of things I've got in this stock. So I can do that and click apply. So now as that stock depletes, uh, that flow rate will also uh, decrease. And we can see that if we look up here uh, at the rate of uh, eggs coming into being, the laying of eggs, um, because actually what that's specified as, as we saw, was uh, a combination of the variable and also a stock level, in this case chickens. Now because chickens wasn't automatically linked in, I had to add a link from that stock into that flow rate. But I could have automatically referred to eggs, for example. But of course, um, unless, uh, unless chickens are conscious of how many eggs are around them, it probably isn't, uh, their laying rate probably isn't determined by the number of eggs that are in the system. Maybe they are. So fundamentally, that's it. I mean, that's basically how you create a system dynamics model. You think of your stocks and flows, and then the rates of those flows between them, which are usually dependent on a combination of some variables which capture things that aren't captured by stocks and flows um, and uh, your stock levels uh, and pretty much any system dynamics model can be described in that way and once you uh, you've got your model running you can click simulate at the top here and that will then run uh, your model and it will show you the uh, the number of chickens and eggs in this case of your stock levels over time um, and uh, if we go back to the uh, Actually, just before I go back to the slides, if I show you, so uh, by default, it'll come up with a table. Uh, you can actually add your own displays. You can choose to have um, a scatter plot or uh, a time series graph, and you can select which data you want to include. So I want, okay, I want the number of chickens versus the number of eggs. If I click apply, it'll show me a graph uh, of that over time, except I'm at a lower resolution, so it doesn't allow me to do that. I don't think, unless I can zoom out. No, it doesn't work. Um, so you can very easily run and um, bring up your uh, bring up your models in in that way. Uh, so as a reminder, uh, just to uh, go back to it a little bit here. So um, we said in this particular model. Uh, so if you're interpreting your results, we started with 100 chickens uh, and zero eggs at time zero. Then after a week, we've still got 100 chickens, but now we've got 500 eggs because all of our 100 chickens laid five eggs each. Then in week uh, two, uh, we've got some more chickens and some more eggs. So we've got uh, uh, 266 and two thirds of uh, chickens. And that's the 100 we had previously, plus a third of these 500 eggs. Remember a third of those eggs, those 500 eggs, have now hatched into becoming chickens. So um, then we get the 167 um, additional chickens on top of 100 before and in terms of the eggs we've got 833 and a third that's because we had 500 eggs previously we've got 500 new eggs that have been hatched by uh, our 100 chickens so we've now got a thousand eggs but as we've just said a third of those eggs have flowed out from being an egg and have now become a chicken so we need to take off a third of that as well so that, that that's um when you're, it can look a bit weird when you're looking at your results thinking why, why are those numbers coming up? But that's essentially what it's doing. So that's uh, Insight Maker uh, and System Dynamics in a nutshell. But now over to you with an exercise I like to call Chicks with Guns. So in this exercise, you are going to expand uh, the chicken and egg model uh, that we previously demonstrated. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a copy of the model. And I'll show you how to do that. Let me actually, let me just come back out. So when you log into Insight Maker, um, actually I'll just give you the link, that'll be easier. Um, 
when I'll give you the, the direct link so you can find uh, this particular model. This will, as long as you're logged in, that will take you to the model. What you'll then need to do is take a clone of it, a copy. And you do that by clicking Clone Insight up here on the top right. If you click that, uh, it'll say, are you sure you want to do that? It'll then send me a notification saying somebody's cloned your Insight. Um, and then it creates it in your own online workspace. Uh, you'll have your own copy of the chickens and eggs model that you can play with to your, uh, to your heart's content. So you're going to take a clone of uh, that model and then you're going to make the following changes uh, to that cloned copy. So we've got a very simple chicken and egg model here. Um, so you're going to expand this to incorporate this, this extra detail. The first detail is that not all eggs are fertilized. So of course in our model we're assuming that uh, yes chickens lay five eggs a week but not all of them are going to be fertilized and, and become uh, chicks. Uh, and so uh, I want you to change the model so that not all eggs are fertilized. And I want you to make the proportion of eggs that are fertilized a user definable variable for the slider, uh, which defaults uh, to one. So uh, by default, 100% of eggs would be fertilized just as they are now. Now, to make this simpler, I only want you to model fertilized eggs in your model. So you're only capturing eggs that are fertilized. You don't need to model eggs that are not fertilized in any way. Uh, I also want you to capture the fact that chickens can either die through natural causes uh, or predation by foxes because of course when we ran this model before um, we just had an exploding population of chickens and eggs because our ch chickens never died. So I want you to capture the fact that chickens unfortunately uh, do and can die um, either through natural causes or uh, through predation by foxes. Uh, I will, now chickens have an average lifespan of around seven years. So that will allow you to model death through natural causes. Foxes, which you'll also need to model, uh, give birth to around five kits per year. Uh, I want you to uh, model that and start with 100 foxes in the model uh, and no kits. Now kits move into adulthood uh, the point at which they start finding their own food uh, at around 12 weeks of age. So I want you to capture that. I want you to capture the fact that foxes have an average lifespan uh, of four years. Uh, so you need to remember that your foxes uh, can also die through natural causes. And uh, I want you to make an initial assumption that each fox kills one chicken every five weeks but I want you to make that a user-definable variable. So the, uh, the predation rate of foxes should be something that the user can change, but by default, uh, a fox will kill one chicken every five weeks. And once you've built that model, uh, I want you to use it to answer the following two questions. First of all, assuming that all else is as above, what's the minimum proportion of eggs that need to be fertilized to ensure that our chicken population doesn't die out uh, within one year. And then secondly, if 80% of eggs were fertilized, how much more regularly would a fox need to kill a chicken to make the species extinct within a year? Uh, so yes, I am asking you to build a model uh, to see how murderous foxes need to be to wipe out the population of chickens, which is a very odd exercise, but it does nicely demonstrate uh, system dynamics. Uh, now I want you to work in groups to do this. I'm going to split you uh, into a number of groups. How many got? Just over 20. So probably four groups. Um, so uh, I want you to all to contribute uh, within the groups. Think about how you're going to build up the model and then start building this up, uh, taking into account each of these things that I've asked you to add. Uh, I will float around between the, the, the groups as well. Um, so if you need any help, just shout. Um, and then once you've built your model, uh, then use it to answer uh, these questions here. Uh, are there any questions about uh, any of that? Um, just briefly, mm -hmm. the third of eggs hatching into chickens every week, mm -hmm. um, doesn't that mean that your chicken population grows exponentially because a third of clusters being hatched when they're not? Um, 
well it's it's they're growing exponentially uncontrolled in the model in the initial model because nothing is stopping them no, they're not flowing out the other side so yeah. um uh yes you're right in that obviously a third of the egg isn't really hatching per week but nonetheless the overall dynamics of the system if you just zoom out are that that would be an exponential increase uh, however of course that's not uh, going to be the case because of these other some of these other factors and more that would then stop um that that population increase being exponential yeah so you don't need to account for the fact a third of them hatched when technically a third of them haven't hatched you don't need to put them in like a holding pen for example no no that and that's the thing with system dynamics you you, you say okay i've now got um, a third of my eggs uh, have hatched, or sorry, a third of an egg, is, let's take one egg because it's easy to think about. I've got an egg, uh, after one week a third of that has hatched uh, into uh, a third of a chicken. That's how it works. <laughs> you could, you could, Dan, you could yeah. theory, theoretically model um, time to maturity though, couldn't you? 18 weeks? Yes, you could. So I, I believe, so think back to um, the first session where um, Dave showed you the COVID model. Um, he showed you a conveyor. So a conveyor is something in um, system dynamics that basically allows you to model that a delay. So you can say, I want uh, this to enter this bit, and then it'll be delayed for a certain period of time, and then it'll become this thing. What I would say is that generally speaking, if you're doing that for everything, you're probably n using the wrong modeling method because that's typically not how you create event simulation. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, um, in yeah. fact, that's quite yeah, a common thing to, yeah. to, to build an SD model and then think, actually, this is a discrete event model, isn't it? <laughs> I've done it many times myself. You're, you're getting too detailed, aren't you, when you start putting in things like maturity and all those, those sort of things? Yeah. Although, of course, so yeah. you're, you're going to have to model a little bit of that here, although you don't need to use a conveyor. Uh, so, essentially, you need to model the fact that there are uh, baby foxes growing into adult foxes. Um, but you don't need to use a conveyor for that. Um, but you will need to model separately baby foxes and uh, adult foxes. But, so, you, but, so you should really model baby chickens and, and adult chickens then, shouldn't you? <laughs> probably yes. Although yes, I, I'm not. Yeah. I certainly. I mean, I, I will just add this disclaimer. In no way is this uh, a, a meant to be a particularly realistic uh, <laughs> model of chickens and eggs and foxes. Um, although I will say, uh, actually, I, I did research quite a lot of the data to go into it. So it's bizarrely accurate in some aspects. Um, but yes, there's a lot missing. So, um, any other questions? Okay, in which case I'll set you into breakout rooms now. Um, I'll give you an hour, but make sure you stretch your legs for five minutes uh, within that time. So we'll resume uh, just after sort of five past three um, and uh, I'll float around and see how you're getting on. Dan, Dan. Yeah, hello. Where, where are you putting the link to your insight? Oh, yes, good point. Let me do that first. And let me do the other thing that I always forget and I'll enable screen sharing. <laughs> Let's do that right now. Uh, okay. So that should work, um, but shout if it doesn't. I will put into uh, Slack right now the link. Uh, you'll need to be logged into Insight Maker for this. Uh, which module are we? Seven. So it's in the module seven channel. Uh, I've put the link. So if you follow that link, uh, you'll be able to uh, get to that model directly. Take a clone of that. So you're building it up from that. You don't have to do the initial chicken egg. But you probably want to first just uh, have a look at that model, make sure you understand how that bit's working, uh, and that will give you clues to do the rest of it. Okay, cool. Right, let me pause the recording.